So before diving into the history of empire and colonialism, uh, which we will be trying to pack into a 30 minute lessons, uh, lesson and will therefore be a mere overview of a very, very complex uh, and charged history. I, I feel that we should clarify what is meant by those terms um, because students often are given empire and colonialism as a package, but rarely, rarely receive an explanation why a term like this should suffice. A very quick explanation would be the following. Um, colonialism is the practice of taking over a territory and colonize it, uh, which may mean extracting its resources and or place settlers there. It is an intrinsically coercive action and usually implies mistreatment, to say the least, for the local population. Uh, empire, instead, is a political entity resulting from the union of colonies uh, with the so-called motherland or fatherland. Um, so you, you colonize a place and together you form an empire. And additionally, imperialism is an ideology, a belief system. Uh, the term imperialism started to be using in the late 19th century, as we will see, and it has been used to describe the ideology behind European, Japanese, American uh, colonial expansion in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, it is also used to, to describe a domination of a country over another territory, even in cultural terms, uh, but this is debated issue. Uh, historians are still debating over the exact definition, and there are many schools of thought. But in short and simplistic terms, colonialism is the practice, empire is the political entity, and imperialism is its ideology. Uh, if imperialism is a relatively new concept, empires have long existed. Um, think of the Roman Empire, uh, the Byzantine Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, um, and ancient Greek cities used to have colonies uh, in the Mediterranean, um, though many cities did not call themselves uh, empires uh, because they practice more of a kind of a, a fraternal network. Athens uh, did rule over a kind of empire. Uh, in the 1500s, uh, when our narrative starts, so early modern Europe, uh, there were many rising empires as uh, navigation techniques were revealing new territories uh, to Europeans and, and traveling became faster and more efficient. Uh, you can see a map of the world here uh, in 1550, uh, but let's be clear. Uh, we are talking about just European empires here. As a side note, uh, because we should always zoom out, empires were present in other parts of the world too, like in Asia, so you can see here, um, at the same time. Uh, this is, I think, important to remember. But let's go back to European empires, because this is our, our focus. Empires should, uh, could take many different forms. Um, land empires, uh, such as the Ottoman Empire, uh, or maritime empires, uh, like uh, the Spanish or the British Empire. Uh, one thing was certainly in common, and that is coercion, violence. Um, however, the focus of the imperial enterprise could vary. Um, it could be focused on establishing a commercial network like the British and the Dutch empires, or focused on, uh, on, on state building. Um, like the Spanish and Portuguese empire. Um, this focus could, of course, shift over time and even vary from colony to colony, depending on the situation and on the period of time we're talking about. Let's start um, with the Iberian empires. Um, the Iberian empires, the Spanish and Portuguese empires, were estab established especially in Central and South America. Um, the Portuguese empire uh, started off with a wider scope uh, but as it lost its territories in the east to the Dutch Empire, it came to completely focus on nowadays Brazil. Uh, the Spanish Empire expanded instead from the Caribbeans southwards and eventually as west as the Philippines. Both empires were essentially extractive enterprises. They forced local manpower to extract resources such as silver, gold, diamonds, and they then shipped them to Europe and used them for their internal purposes. Another case study is the empires of Northwestern Europe. They occupied North America, a small part of uh, uh, Central and South America, and trading posts in Africa and Asia. Um, this is not yet the imperial reach of later periods, which you will be probably you will be know. Um, most of the colonies uh, in Africa and Asia uh, consisted of fortified posts along the coast, uh, so nothing in the interior, uh, from where resources were traded. And in Africa, humans 
uh, were trafficked to use uh, in the plantations of, in the Americas, so slavery. Um, North America was special uh, because the French and especially the British Empire brought many settlers uh, who forcibly displaced the locals and made uh, themselves at home, so to say. Uh, anywhere else, Northwestern empires, and especially the British, British and the Dutch empires, are sometimes defined as merchant empires. Now, this is perhaps a sanitized uh, definition because it kind of hides the violence um, behind the trade, which was an imposed trade. Uh, but it is accurate in the sense that territorial expansion was not a priority at that point. Uh, North America uh, was once again different uh, in that it was perceived as a truly virgin new world, though it wasn't, and settlers really did settle. Uh, the 18th century saw a renewed push uh, in the colonial enterprise for these North, uh, Northern, uh, Western uh, European empires. For instance, the Dutch Empire expanded even faster in Asia. Um, the British Empire expanded too, and this is, this is something interesting. It was in the wake of its transformation into the modern United Kingdom. Uh, you may know that uh, the crown of England uh, and Wales uh, with, um, with, uh, with a colony in Ireland um, uh, unified with the Crown of Scotland, 1707, uh, the Treaty of Union, which abolished the Scottish Parliament. Uh, what is quite interesting in this, uh, in this development is that um, this development was not solely internal. Uh, it was also due to the spectacular failure of the Scottish colony of Darien, which is uh, located, which was located in the modern day Panama in Central America. And this had bankrupted the state of Scotland and provided momentum for the, for the definitive annexion of, uh, of the country uh, to England. Um, so the effects of colonial expansion had truly global impacts um, on the colonized, but also on the colonizers. Another interesting example of a nascent colonial power is that of Russia. Uh, having won its long conflict with Sweden, um, which had ceased to be a great power uh, from early 18th century, so 1700s, Russia declared itself an empire. Uh, this is not really a novelty because Russian rulers uh, considered themselves the inheritors of Rome and Constantinople. Uh, they called themselves Tsars, which is uh, the equivalent for Caesar. Um, but now it became a reality. The Russian Empire expanded south and eastwards. Siberia, in particular, uh, became Russia's uh, virgin territory, a bit like the Far West will become um, the virgin territory for the USA later on. And Russia followed typical colonial patterns, uh, building fortifications as it, as it advanced, uh, displacing and replacing populations along the way, uh, plundering and extracting resources. In conclusion, uh, early modern colonialism uh, displayed already the capacity for violence that uh, will fully explode in the 19th century in modern Europe. Um, but there was no other way for colonialism to operate. This is important to remember. It was an exploiting enterprise. Uh, and in order to function, it had to employ coercion. Uh, it had, however, to adapt to the colonized territories. So it could evolve into a settler society, North America, for instance, uh, where territories were sparsely populated and the local populations had been dispersed and or killed. Uh, in Asia, Western powers often relied on uh, local authorities. In South America, the Iberian empires replicated their own system of government uh, via vice royalties. In any case, uh, colonies were essentially considered sweatshops uh, and providers of raw materials uh, that fuel fueled Europe's nascent capitalism. Uh, the settling population was very diverse. Uh, but most often consisted of the poorer levels of European populations um, or were military personnel. Um, Russia uh, was an exception as it concerns military personnel because uh, most of the replacing population consisted of Serbs. Um, while Spanish America was particularly prone to uh, generating mixed families, which was called the process of creolization. Um, that's, that's because settlers were most often men and local population had been forcibly Christianized, thus being a bit more um, receptive to, to mixing. Um, but make no mistake, 
pure European blood, as they used to call it, was still firm, firmly in power. Um, the same happened, though, to a lesser extent uh, in, Af in Africa and Asia. Why to a lesser, lesser extent? Because uh, the merchant empires that held sway there, uh, they were government-sponsored, but they were private enterprises, so they allowed fewer settlers in their territories. Uh, the exception, once again, was North America, uh, and that is why there evolved a settler society there. So the 19th century saw the explosion of the colonial enterprise. Uh, Western powers had laid claim to uh, a staggering percentage of the planet and did so by fully and formally incorporating those territories into the polities. Um, the destructive nature of colonialism and the sophistication of European capitalism pushed in this direction. Uh, governments needed more direct control of those territories and of the peoples living there. You can see this is the evolution from early 19th century and then you go to 1898. This is the extent of the of the of the of the colonies, uh, mostly held by European powers. Is also Japan. Um, the economic structures in the colonies everywhere have been completely devastated and rebuilt from scratch uh, to be to benefit the colonial powers. So the output, so what they produced, uh, was entirely focused on producing what Europe needed. So, for instance, cotton, raw materials, they were produced there in the colonies, they were taken over to Europe uh, to be processed there, and this left the, the colonies at the mercy of global markets or of their mm, colonizers, uh, because their entire production had left the country. Um, Congo is an especially violent example of extractive colonialism, uh, especially while it was uh, ruled directly by Leopold II, king of the Belgians, and it it may be worth uh, detailing this history because it's an especially striking case study. Um, so the Congo basin in Africa, Central Africa, um, was claimed by Portugal. Uh, but Portugal was not anyway in a position to control such a vast territory. So King Leopold II was keen to claim this territory for Belgium because he was convinced uh, rightly so, um, that he could profit from his natural resources. The Belgian uh, parliament was, however, uh, reluctant to invest in the enterprise, so King Leopold set out to own the Congo directly. Um, he managed to achieve these objectives by means of a very deft uh, political campaign. Uh, he claimed that the Portuguese would pursue slave trade there, whereas he would not. Uh, he would pursue uh, humanitarian and educational objectives. This was a very common trope in, uh, in, uh, in the in 19th century that the colonizers would go uh, to these colonies to, to pursue this kind of educational humanitarian objectives. And um, these and other political maneuvering, for instance, he um, offered untaxed trade to British, uh, British merchants. Um, this convinced the other European states uh, to give him absolute power in Congo in 1884, during the infamous Berlin conference uh, that saw European countries assigning portions of Africa to one another. You will surely study that moment. Um, you can look up the details of the subsequent events. Uh, but it may suffice to say uh, humanitarian conditions in Congo rapidly became horrific. Uh, the rubber trade exploded in those years and Leopold established a monopoly of rubber uh, production in Congo, uh, reducing the population to what was basically slavery. Um, each member, each, uh, each Congolese person had to add a quota of rubber to produce. And if they failed to do so, they were meant to be killed. Uh, by the local police, who was, which was normally made of made up of men that had been kidnapped as kids from the local region, uh, but they uh, would save the bullets for private hunting, and instead they would just chop feet and hands as evidence of of a punishment uh, done. Um, an incredibly cynical propaganda uh, action clouded this uh, this situation, and there was a counter propaganda by activists which include the missionaries, but also intellectuals. There were books uh, written by Joseph Conrad, as you know, The Heart of Darkness, and Conan Doyle, uh, the, 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 the creator of Sherlock Holmes, also participated. Uh, in the end, the Belgian parliament stepped up, took control of the colony in, 1980, uh, in 1908. Um, at that point, the Belgian Congo entered a less horrific, uh, but still very coercive and 
let's say, normal status as a European colony, and that um, which ended in uh, 1960 with the independence of Congo. Uh, so this system was not entirely rational, of course, um, but it was a direct consequence of increasingly sophisticated scientific and rational ideas involving race, econ economy, and modernity. Um, the, nowadays, we wouldn't call them scientific and rational, but at the time, they were, were, were meant to be scientific and rational. Uh, it was so rooted in ideology, in fact, that even when Western governments um, intervened in their colonies with good intentions, with which admittedly did not happen much, but it occasionally did. It still resulted in damage to the locals because they, they never really took the time to study the local environment, local customs, et cetera. They just tried to apply their idea of modernity on, on, in their colonies. Uh, imperialism as, a, as an ideology was born then. Uh, it sustained the extractive structure of colonialism but it fortified it uh, by adding scientific considerations and misguided ideas of white superiority and of the white burden of educating the world and initiating it to modernity, to its idea of modernity. Um, this ideological drive was not just a government push. It took a life of its own. Um, it was the drive behind, for instance, missionary societies in Africa and Asia. Uh, they were independent and often at odds uh, with Western governments. Uh, but we're all the same massive drivers of cultural change in many colonies, introducing foreign concepts and customs that often participated in destroying local cultures. Um, now, it is extremely important to remember, though, uh, local societies were not just hapless victims. Uh, they did fight to retain their own agency. Um, they did rebel when they could. Jamaica, 1831, for instance, uh, India, 1857. Um, excellent examples that you could look up. Uh, they, um, they were often able to pick and choose ideas and customs, missionaries and other Westerners try to impose. Many European-born concepts, for instance, such as socialism, nationalism, to stay on big ideas, were appropriated by local intellectuals and then used to push back when they, when, when they will fight for independence. Scientific imperialism, in many way, was key in the development of what are commonly thought as uh, Western sciences, such as medicine, anthropology, uh, which breakthroughs were often based on research conducted in colonies and on locals, um, normally without their consent. Uh, and uh, museums were linked to this evolution. Um, it took, they took off uh, in this period and were conceived as a crystallizers of white hegemony and superiority, kind of like a photograph. Um, the logical extreme consequence of this situation, of this musealization of the sciences of, this, uh, of, of white hegemony, uh, were the so-called human zoos, um, live displays of non-Europeans uh, who were forcibly sent to Europe, dressed in traditional clothes and forced to pretend to go through everyday life in this place, which became uh, incredibly crowded attractions. Many would die uh, due to hardship and unsanitary conditions. One of the last of such live displays happened in Brussels uh, for the 1958 International Expo 1958 is a shockingly recent date, but it is true, 1958. Um, a special aside now uh, must be made for slave tra trade and slavery. Uh, not because it was an aside to colonialism, but exactly because slave trade was a key feature of the entire system. Uh, it was the logical end to the idea of white superiority and the logical end to the extractive nature of Western capitalism supported by the colonies. Uh, it was, of course, an extremely violent process uh, from end to end, which saw victims at its every stage, from capture to trade, travel, and then forced labor. Um, but it wasn't an uncontested practice. Um, there were active Western societies in which many people of African origin also participated. Um, keep this in mind when you hear justifications uh, up to the fact that back then they didn't know they didn't know that it was wrong. They actually didn't know it was a debate, and there were active societies that fought against this. A key moment in the fight against the slave trade and slavery uh, is the Haitian Revolution of 1791, uh, when the slave population of Haiti, a colony of France, inspired by the French Revolution, revolted and established a republic. 
Revolutionary France abolished slavery, but Napoleon reintroduced it in 1802. And by the way, revolutionary France also fought against the Republic of Haiti to, to reconquer the, the colony. Um, other countries um, started abolishing slavery and separately, uh, not always at the same time, slave trade. You, 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 the difference is slave trade is the actual practice of or commercial practice of trafficking humans. Slavery is the actual practice of uh, forced labor. Um, slavery anyway continued in certain colonies uh, and also in some post-colonial countries such as Brazil and very, very well-known example of the USA. By the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the war was in great part militarily uh, occupied by Europeans and by the USA and Japan. But imperial ideology had also generated an awareness of what it meant to be colonized. Um, in Europe, some ethnic groups came to see themselves as colonized peoples themselves. Um, likewise, imperial ideology was the basis for expansionism of, of Nazi Germany or for the Hungarian nationalist imperial aspirations. In short, imperialism had become an ideology fully out of control uh, of the imperial powers. Uh, it had entered public consciousness uh, and frankly has remained there ever since. Uh, it was even an ideological, uh, ideological fault line uh, during the Cold War. The Soviet Union used it to accuse uh, the US and its European allies, uh, many of which, as you can see here, retained colonies well into the 1960s and beyond. Um, but the Soviet Union itself was an empire, as shown uh, by its grip on Eastern and Central Europe. The imperial ideology had become very sophisticated. Uh, so much so that there were even distinct uh, schools of thought. There was a British way, which implied indirect rule, uh, recognition of native authorities, uh, respect for local customs, and a French way, uh, which pushed for direct rule, assimilation, and centralization. But of course, fully direct rule was impossible, and colonial powers had always to rely on the support of part of the local elites. But in any case, colonial rule was never benevolent and always played for the benefit of the colonial power. Uh, there was a power relation there. Um, it was once again a deeply coercive and violent system, which at its most sophisticated, which is in the middle of the 20th century, included very autonomous colonial agents, uh, which could apply laws and be as brutal as they uh, felt they should. Colonial policing, which uh, was extremely brutal as well, because it was not consensual in its ever present objective, which is extraction of resources, uh, which had to be coercive because it was imposed. Um, and anyway, colonial legislation was different uh, than that applied in the West, and so in the mother of fatherlands so on the colonizers, um, thus ensuring the colonial subjects were always fully subaltern uh, in an inferior class of citizens. Um, what's more, uh, for all, the talk about their civilizing mission and the white man burden, colonial powers uh, invested incredibly little resources into education and literacy. Um, the few individuals that managed to be educated, uh, often in the colonial powers themselves, uh, became key actors in the subsequent fights for independence. So they went to, to, the, to the colonizers, the motherland, the fatherland, uh, in the capitals usually, they studied at their universities and then came back and, and fought for independence. Um, as the imperial system became increasingly difficult to justify to their own citizens, colonial powers took some belated measures um, to ameliorate local conditions, so they started pulling some resources, but we have to remember this was post-World War II, so European powers did not have much money and resources to invest. Uh, but at the same time, they didn't have much uh, manpower either to actually send to the colonies and police and everything. Um, the colonial system anyway remained structurally unjust because it was coercive and as such no major could go beyond temporary benefits or tempor temporary uh, interventions in, uh, in, in, uh, in emergencies, etc. So the colonization came. Uh, in truth, a first wave had materialized in the, in the 18th century and then the, uh, the 19th century, so the late 1700s and then the 19th century uh, in the Americas, South and, and, and North. Um, after World War I, 
um, the colonies of the vanquished countries have become mandates. So the vanquished countries, such as Germany, uh, have become mandates under the under the protection of the League of Nations, which is the predecessor to the to the United Nations. Uh, in in a sense, they were still colonies, but they were nominally called mandates, and they were under the um, over on the supervision of win of the winning powers, be it um, be it France or the uh, or the United Kingdom. Um, but as time went by, and especially after World War II, uh, colonies started to struggle to become independent. Um, the USA, though an imperial power itself, um, thinking the past, uh, the Philippines or Cuba, um, could not lend its might to its European allies to fight back. It was traditional and rhetorical reasons. We have to remember that the, the, the US uh, rhetoric, national rhetoric, was uh, revolving around the fact that they had fought against the British Empire. So they couldn't very well um, defend imperial, European imperialism uh, in the 20th century. And the colonies started using the self-determination principle too, which had been championed by the US in Europe after World War I. Uh, it was meant for European population. The self-determination principle uh, basically meant that local population had the right to choose how to self-govern and who should govern them. It was meant for Europe, but of course it went global. Um, anyway, decolonization was not uh, a, a war of words. It was a, an actual fight. It was never a pacific handover from colonizers to colonized. Uh, local populations had to fight hard to obtain their independence. And it was often a violent and bloody struggle, uh, which is appropriate because of the bloody history of colonialism itself. Uh, but the colonization is another story for another day. <laughs>